music on that I think a lot of you will recognize. <laughs> Oh, that's what I have. I could not dance it. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I think well, there's you know who that is, right? Yeah. Chris. Yeah. From Albuquerque. I just saw a Bill Mayberry. Hey, What's Bill? up, guys? We tried they we tried to dance that at, at the memorial. John Jones played that and it was pretty pretty uh, dismal. <laughs> Well, I just want to welcome you all to this. Uh, we've been, I've been looking forward to this since about March or April. And I know there's more people joining us at all times. So we'll just kind of keep bringing people in. Um, I just want to welcome you to the Zoom release party. Uh, we've already talked about the menu bar down at the bottom. And if you can f find the chat and the participant in the chat box, would you please type your name and where you're from? I'm going to be muting you, or Lynn and I. I'm going to mute everybody until um, until we get to another point. That way, there's no um, issues around sound. You'll notice in the participants area too. There is a a yes, a no. Um, go slower. Go faster. And then there's several little, there's an up finger, a down finger, uh, waving at me, a coffee cup that you're going to take a break, and then time out, we're done. I'm going to, we're going to be doing a poll here in just a minute, and, um, and uh, we'll, so we'll, we'll play with that. You also have a raise your hand uh, icon, and we're going to have a question and answer session at the end of this. I'm sure it's going to generate lots of questions. That's just the way things like this are. And I, I'm a teacher, so I love questions. Don't hesitate on asking questions. But there will be a designated time at the end. So don't, uh, if you can hold on to your question, that would help. Um, I'm hoping that this will be an hour. We may be a little bit over because I have a lot of a lot of great resources to share with you. Uh, we're going to talk about how the book came about some tidbits about it. Uh, I've got some sound bites, which you've already experienced one. Uh, you're gonna hear Flippo's own words and you're gonna hear a couple of his songs. Um, so also we're gonna have a um, door prize time at the end. And so you must be present to win. So you have to stay for the whole thing. And um, <laughs> the other thing about it is too, is that I'm I'm gonna eliminate I'm gonna uh, limit the uh, winners of the door prize to the United States and Japan. Now you might wonder why I'm doing Japan. The, it's because of the big um, uh, expense. I've been mailing things all over, and the expense to Japan is unbelievable. But we have, or the expense all over. I've I've mailed to Denmark to. Um, where else have I, England or various places. So uh, because of the expense, I'm, it's very hard to do the door prizes. However, I do, have, I do know somebody that might be going to Japan in the next few months. So she has agreed to take any, if any of the Japanese listeners uh, are the winners, but it could be a few months before they get over there. I have a phone call from somebody that's trying to get on, I know. Let me take it real quick. Hello? Lynn? Lynn? Oh no, that isn't working. Lynn? Lynn? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Are you having trouble? Are, yeah, are you, are you in the waiting room? Oh yeah, there's several yeah. in the waiting room. Sorry. Sorry, I just, okay. I just added you all. Okay, sorry. Okay. We're, we're figuring this out, folks, sorry. <laughs> I, you may wonder why we I did the waiting room. There's I've been at some meetings here in Albuquerque and they've been having trouble with uh, Zoom bombers and I didn't wanna have any negative experiences for us tonight. So that's the reason we did the waiting room. Okay, 
I just want to let you know where I'm at. I'm coming to you from the East Mountains above Albuquerque. Our mailing address is to Harris, New Mexico, but in reality, we live in the trees. Uh, we have a beautiful uh, place here with nobody around us. And my husband, Lynn, everybody wave at Lynn. He is helping me a lot on this. And um, so that's the, uh, the down and out of it. One of my really good friends that's on this I had a suggestion. Patty Ann gave me an idea for this. So she, we, she should suggested that we all grab a glass of scotch, which was Flippo's favorite drink, and a cigarette. Yeah, Flippo smoked and I don't, so we don't have, I don't have any cigarettes. I don't have any scotch either. And to join us for the release party for the celebration of Marshall Flippo and his life. So if you don't have scotch, you can still join us. But I know that Patty Ann's got scotch. So, so the very first poll that I'm going to ask you to take is, and you guys know where that's at, it's over on the participant side. Who, attend, who attending tonight has ever sat and enjoyed a drink with Marshall Flippo? Well, where is mine? <laughs> it's over and underneath the participants. There it is. Yeah, I did. Oh, I see people are raising their hands too. That works too. Yeah, okay. a lot of people, a lot of people that knew Marshall Flippo knew that uh, an evening after, a party after the dance was uh, the party and it was cigarettes and scotch and whatever and stories galore. He loved stories. So we're not in it together. Uh, one of the things that's really true about Mar one of the things that I learned about Marshall Flippo is he had a motto and his motto was, I was at the right place at the right time. So we're going to be going, we're going to be connecting back to that motto every once in a while tonight. And here is him talking about that motto, being at the right place at the right time. Could you hear that? Let me do a sound check with you. Could you hear it? Yes. Put your thumb up if you could hear it. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure because one of the things is is the the sound transmission is not as good as I had a really great clip for that that went on for about an hour, about a minute and a half, and it was. Um, it was beautiful because he went through different parts of his life, but it was at a time when I interviewed him at Color Lab in a restaurant and there was so much back no background noise, you couldn't hear it very clearly. So, I made it just you know, to to he, really felt, he really felt he was lucky. And if you look at his life, he would look at, he would think about when he was in the Navy and his service there and how he got to play baseball in the Navy. You'll learn about that. His getting the auctioneer to be the hit of, of his career was, he felt lucky. His getting, his happenstance of getting to go to Kirkwood and be the staff caller there for 42 years, he felt was lucky. His tour that grew out of that Kirkwood uh, connection that he made with all those dancers he really, really felt that that was luck. And then that led to his international tour. You know, it all kind of hooked together. And whenever he would talk about it, he always would say, you know, I was lucky. I was at the right place at the right time. And I don't know if you heard in the soundbite, but he said, and Talon had very little to do with it. And, you know, um, the question I would pose to you right now, was it luck or skill? I'll let you, I'll let you ponder that as we continue through this evening. I want to tell you now about how the book was came about. And this is the cover of the paperback, which is the same for the hardback. So this is the book. And uh, how did it come about? In March of 2017, Lynn and I were at a square dance and we were at an after party on Saturday night. 
and a group of people said, you know, we were talking about Flippo. He has his, you know, he was talking about his career was winding down and, and everything. And uh, somebody said, well, why don't somebody write his, his uh, biography? And Lynn looked at me and said, well, you're the writer in the group. Why don't you do it? He remembers this different. He has a, he has a different story. But anyway, so we, I went home. And I thought about it. We thought about it as a couple, what the commitment would be. I called Flip and I said, Flip, what would you say about me writing your uh, biography? He goes, nobody would want to read that. But he said, I do have a story that people would love to hear. And that's all of the, the things that those traveling callers do when they're out and about. Then he started laughing. He said, no, that'd be X-rated. There's no way you could do that. So he would, he would not give me an answer that night, that day when I called. So he was coming to Albuquerque in May of 2017 to do the, uh, his last official contract in Albuquerque. And so I said, you know, we're going to talk and I want, I want to find out, you know, if, you're, if this is going to work. So Friday night, he's standing at the, at the railing there at our dance hall, and all of the local callers are standing around him, and some of the state callers, because everybody, you know, love Flip, and he brought it up. He said, guys, Loretta wants me to write her, write uh, my uh, biography. What do you guys think? Who in the world would want to buy it? Everybody in the group raised their hand. And so he was, you know, he was kind of outvoted. And then he said, okay, I'll give you the answer you come over to my room about 1.30 in the morning, this morning, and I'll give you my answer. And uh, of course, we all laughed, and I went and told Lynn that, and Lynn went over on the next break and said, Flip, uh, Loretta's not coming over at 1.30, but I am. And because uh, Flip and Lynn always had this great uh, camaraderie going back and forth. So anyway, that weekend, he said yes. And you know, one of the things I look, you know, you always look back on life and think, oh shoot, I wish I'd have done it differently. From June to October, we didn't do anything. We didn't meet, we didn't talk, but I had a trip planned to Tucson in October. So we planned to meet in October. We did a face-to-face, -face. we met at a steakhouse and had a dinner. And it just happened to be during the World Series and man, he was watching that game, you know, there was, TV's 360 and he's such a baseball fan and it was the the Texans were playing too and so he was really excited but we met and he sent me home with a stack seven albums and uh, so we started our interviews and um, it was amazing because there came kind of a shift in it all in March on two, of 2018 at Color Lab um, we put together, we decided we were going to meet together, but prior to that, and I think he's on the, on the call tonight, a, a friend of ours named Stan Jeffus, what had happened is Nisa, Flippo's first wife, had created for him three beautiful scrapbook albums, and that was part of the stack of things that he handed to me, and Stan had used some of the pictures in a, a beautiful DVD. If you haven't gotten it, you need to get a copy for Flip's uh, celebration that they did in Paris, Texas. And so I emailed Stan and said, do you have those pictures and would you lend them to me? And he did, and oh my God, that it's saved us. So what I did in March when Flippo and I met at Color Lab, I sent those albums back with him and I had the digital version. And so from then on, we, uh, we used those albums to kind of spur his memory. And uh, at Color Lab, we, on Wednesday uh, morning and afternoon, we had about four hours together. And it was just really, um, it was really good. We finished one whole album there. From then on, we did weekly phone calls from October 2017 until October the 27th, 2018. And that was the last time that I talked to him. He was super involved in the creation of this book, the title, how it was laid out. He had say in the whole thing. And I wondered about how he even knew about book production, but uh, Bob Osgood had produced a book called The Caller's Text, I believe is the name of it. And Flippo had a chapter in that book. So he <laughs> knew pretty much, he knew what, what to do. 
So that's how it all started. That's how it was begun. And what we're going, what I'm going to do now is, a lot of us are square dancers. I think everybody on the call is square dancers or a caller, and we all have our own individual stories about how we started square dancing. I want you to listen to how Flip started, and tell me, let me know if the uh, the uh, sound isn't good. Hey, we're going square dancing. Oh wait, 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 wait! Just a minute. <laughs> It didn't start at the beginning, just a second. One night she said, hey, we're going square dancing. I said, what? <laughs> she said, there's a lady downtown, the caller is starting a new square dance class. And we're going. And I've talked to Hazel. Hazel is Hub's wife. Well, Hub was my oh. friend. So, uh, we're still just kids, really. <laughs> but uh, I talked to Hazel, and she's all for it. She talked up into going. Oh. So uh, that night, I can remember it just like I'm sitting here. That night, we went to the square dance. We are pulling up to the square dance, and Hook says, look, oh, I'm more scared right now than I was on either team or not. <laughs> Hub was in the in the Marines and he had it tough, and he would have came out like all the Marines did. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but I was in the Navy and my uh, my Iwo Jima wasn't as tough as his. But I said, yeah, me too. So we <laughs> pulled up alongside the curb and looked in, and they were already dancing. Hub said they already started. I ain't going in, and me either. I said that we drove off. No, 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 but they just started. No, we're not going, it done started. Well, the next week they got us there on time. And that and that and that uh first square was my my little sister and her husband. Oh. And so we had three couples we knew and uh we had and it was Hub and Hazel and and then us. The first white most ever friend. I'll guarantee you it was so many. For some reason, I like to touch people. Hmm. And so that was pretty good, you know, going out <coughs> and around shaking hands with everybody. Mm -hmm. So that is his experience of uh, starting square dancing. And I love that story. Um, oops, I don't want this to start. You just, you just. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, I want, I want to get to the book right now and um, talk about some of the um, specifics. For those of you who have um, gotten your books, there's there's been a part that I've gotten some really interesting questions on, and that's the title page where it has Love Flip. And um, I want to tell you where that all came from because it's it's come up several times. Um, I had a, I offered to people to pre-order the book. Many of you all pre-ordered the book. And uh, one person that pre-ordered it specifically said, would you please have Flippo autograph it? And so when Flippo died, and I, you know, it was just heartbroken that he never got to see it. I was heartbroken that Nisa didn't get to see it. But I kept thinking, that just kept running through my mind over and over. How can I get Flippo's autograph on there and I had a brainstorm. And John Flippo, uh, Flip's son and his first wife, Nisa, helped me so much in the production of this book. And so I emailed them and told them my plan and said, do you happen to have a, you know, a, a good legible uh, signature of Flippo's? Well, it was funny because she sent, she, she had sent me, a, or we talked about a couple of them. One of them was his signature on their divorce decree, and it was not very legible. And then the other one was a personal card that Flip had sent her years ago. And so that's the one that I ended up using inside the book. And to me, it just adds, I don't know, I, I thought it added, added a really special flavor to the book. And uh, I don't know. It's just special. I also tell you, those who are, got the book, I, I ended the book with another signature thing of his. So keep an eye out and email me when you find it because 
there really is another very special thing in, in uh, the book that's kind of awesome. So it bookends it. Um, when we started writing, when we started talking about the book, Flip and I started talking about the book, he said, Loretta, I have something I want to go before you say Marshall Flippo was born on September the 2nd, 1927. I want this dirty joke. And I'm going to tell it to you. And I want you to clean it up so we can put it in the book. What do you think? So he told me this, the joke. I laugh like crazy. And I said, yeah, we can, we can make it work. We can make it work. And it, it, to me, it has been hilarious to have that to be part of. The, the beginning of this book is so much flip. I just cannot tell you. Then about, uh, this was later. This was later. And this was near the end of his life. He said, okay, I have something else I want at the beginning of the book before Marshall Flippel was born. And he said, I want to, and he identified, I think there's about 10 of them, 10 callers that influenced his life and had passed away. And so what that told me about the man was that he wanted the book started with humor. He wanted you to laugh. He absolutely wanted you to laugh. But he also wanted you, he also wanted to honor the people that made him such a success. So um, the laughing part, I want to tell you just a little side story here. When I sent him transcripts of the very first of uh, three or four interviews, anytime he laughed, I put giggle in parentheses. And so when he got the transcript, he was like, oh my God, Loretta, you're going to take the, you first thing you got to do is take all those damn giggles out. And so I told him the reason I put them in there was so that I would know when I was rewriting it and writing it in the form that it would be in the book, that I would know what he, what his reaction was and it would be easier to, to set the stage. And he said, oh, okay. So I made sure, and, and it's really funny, a lot of my editors and one of them is, one of the people that was in my writing group is here tonight that helped me with that. Anytime the giggles were found, uh, this friend of mine named Marty, man, she was saying, I found another giggle, I found another giggle. So we made sure that the giggles were gone. So one of, one of the things that we feature in the book is uh, Flippo's tours. And I, I made a graphic and it's in the book. I'm gonna hold it up as close as I can. It's a, it's a graphic of the tours. Now he, all, he called it one tour, but in reality it was, it was three tours. And he did that tour for 42 years. He kept up this schedule. So he worked at Kirkwood from October to April. Then he toured for six months. However, when I started putting everything together, I realized the six months he was at Kirkwood, he also did festivals. He wove festivals into his schedule. So um, his schedule was unbelievable. So his first, his first part of his tour was he went east, he went north and east out of Kirkwood. Then he went south. He did a lot of the eastern seaboard here. He went south, then he did, came back west and got to come home for Christmas at Abilene. And then he did, so, did some jig-jagging around here in the Midwest, and then he went west. So those were the three tours that he did. And he pretty much, I think he pretty much always ended his, his western tour at the Permian Basin Festival in Odessa, Texas. So um, what a schedule that man did. It was unbelievable. I want to read to you um, a couple of pieces out of the book, and then I want to tell you about one part that I want you to be sure and, and see. Um, I wrote this book, uh, I wrote a section in this book called To the Reader, because um, I have a real, I have a strong belief that this book is a history book, and that it's larger than square dancing. It is a history book about square dancing, but it's a slice of Americana. So that's why I wrote the first wrote the first part that's Dear Reader. And so I wanted to read you a, a, a little piece out of this. Star legend, all words used to describe Marshall Flippo in the square dance world. Yet when we started this project, he made me promise that I didn't portray him as a hero. His humble spirit speaks volumes about his view. Marshall Flippo died on Sunday, November the 4th, 2018. He called actively until he was 90 years old, having a 64 year career in the field he loved. During his heyday, he worked at Kirkwood Lodge in Osage Beach, Missouri, 
for half of the year, calling seven nights a week. And the other half, he toured the United States, calling usually six nights a week for 42 years. He endured this grueling schedule because he was doing what he loved. He returned to his Texas roots as often as he could and called the anniversary dance for the Grand Square Square Dance Club in San Antonio for 44 years. He had long-term relationships with many dancers, clubs, and festivals all over the world. He truly was a Renaissance man. The rough times of the depression and the subsequent recession formed Marshall Flippo, forcing the Flippo family to move several times around the Abilene area, searching for lower rental costs and better housing. As a caller, he spent six months of a, of a year for 42 years traveling the country and the world, a gypsy. Did the frequent moves during his early years set him up for this lifestyle? In, it was 1944 and Flippo focused on World War II. He volunteered at 17, influenced by the war's impact on his country and his surroundings. Flippo's older sister and best friend enlisted, leading the way for him. So his patriotism shifted the direction of this young Texan's life away from finishing high school and out to the world. After his service to his country, Filippo returned to Abilene, Texas and met the love of his life, Nisa. A happenstance career that fell into place because of a serendipitous square dance vacation at Kirkwood Lodge in the Lake of the Ozarks of Missouri ultimately changed his life forever. His career spanned six, de six decades and he loved every minute. He came to the activity a bashful young Texan and felt the formula, formula for his sex, success was he was the luckiest man in the world at the right place at the right time. This powerful theme weaves its way through his life story from getting rights home to Abilene, Texas with his friend Thurman Curry, to his naval training in San Diego, California and his baseball career to, the, to all the ins and outs of his successful square dance calling career. So that's into the reader. And then I'm reading this section because it's hilarious. It was hilarious to me. The, it's in chapter two, you're in the Navy now. Um, but let's see. Um, I joined the Navy when I turned six, 17 in 1944. After, after Flippo shared this, he sat quiet. His thoughtful silence spoke volumes. In reviewing the part in the first interview about him joining the Navy, I mistakenly thought he had falsified his records to join. Quickly, he answered, whoa, 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 what did you say about the records? From his tone, I realized I had made a mistake. I thought he told me, I thought you told me that you falsified your records when you were 17. That's how you got into, he interrupted me with a resounding no. So he explained what happened. Well, dad had to sign for me, but we didn't falsify it. I got in. Daddy signed for me, and I went in on my 17th birthday. I didn't falsify anything. So to me, that's really <laughs> that's a profound, profound uh, statement about him. The, the last thing I want to share with you uh, from the book is um, Flip, Flip wanted to tell stories on all of his caller and cure friends, and uh, this was just hilarious for me to to listen to. And so when he, he said, okay, I'm going to make the list. And so he listed 62 names. And when he was remembering them, he remembered them geographically. He would go, he, this is, you know, he would go, He I think what he did is he followed his tour. And he would go along and, oh, this guy's from Memphis, Tennessee, and this, oh, these, these all are from San Antonio. And it was amazing to me on how he thought about it. But anyway, so um, it was really funny, and it was amazing that he could re remember 62 callers that he called with. And then he ended up with a laugh, and he said, and I have another short list to give you, the callers I slept with. And I'm not <laughs> going to I gasped at that moment. So you know what? I'm going to just let you go out and find that story. And I think you might be shocked about who he slept with. Um, the, the, as we move along on this, I'm, I'm trying to keep track on this, but I just want to say a very quick hello to Doc in Japan. Everybody wave to Doc in Japan. Hey, Doc. Hi. Hey, buddy. Hey, Doc. Hi. 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 How are you doing? 
It is so good to see you. Oh, it's so good. Doc was, let me tell you real quick, Doc helped me a lot. Mike Seastrom helped me. Oh, so many people helped me. This was, I tell you, this was a good project. But when I was needing of album covers, when I was needing pictures of album covers, I connected with Mike Seastrom and he said, I know that Doc will have a bunch of them because of a very special dance that, that he did in, um, Japan and so doc a lot of you'll notice whenever you get to that chapter that the recordings chapter that there's a lot of pictures there that um, or of the the album covers were from doc the other person I want you to wave at real quick is Stan Jeffus he's he's here too I, I saw that he came in and he's the man that helped me uh, he's the one that had all the pictures so wow 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 he did he photographed all the pictures that were in the three albums so uh, for those of you who bought, for those of you who bought the book, you have a very special um, piece that you're going to get to participate in, and that is that I have a section on my website. I thought it was all together, and I I've still got to do a little bit of work on it, so it'll be up in the next couple of days. But it's it's a private membership only. You get to it on the website, and the information to get to it is in the back of the book. So you have to have the book. And you have to either have a purchase or, you know, show me how you purchased it. Or if you bought it from me, I know how you purchased it. So, um, but uh, one of the reasons why I had to do that is that when I finished tra transcribing the um, book, I had 258,000 words. Uh, we've got some background noise. Uh, we need to make sure people are muted that are... Um, so I had too much for one book and, uh, Lynn had a great solution and that was to make two books, a book of Filippo's life and then a book of all of his stories. The stories were 70,000 words, just the stories oh. about other colors. So <laughs> unbelievable. So I had to make a choice whenever I, I put this book together. And so I had to choose what went in the book and what didn't. And I thought, my gosh, what am I going to do with all that material that didn't happen, you know, that didn't get in the book? And I came up with the idea. So there is a private member membership section on my website, and you will get a, you email me, they'll get, I'll get you a login, and then you'll be able to access it all. And at this point, there's, there is lots stuff out there, lots of stuff, but there will be more added at all times. So it's a place you're gonna to wanna to come back and visit often. And I wanna give you just a little sampling of what, what's out there. Um, Kirk, Kirkwood was a major, Kirkwood Lodge was a major player in, in Flip's life. And of course, whenever we got to Kirkwood, he kept telling me repeatedly, we gotta have a whole chapter on Kirkwood. Remember that, write that down on the side, we gotta have a whole chapter on Kirkwood. So when we got to Kirkwood, he said, okay, I want to tell a story on every one of the employees. Well, you can guess that that got to be kind of lengthy. And so um, he, um, he did. He told stories about all of the employees and or all of the ones that were key to him at that time. So I, I just wanted to tell you, you know, the thing about, the th the thing about Flippo was, he loved his employees at Kirkwood as much as he loved the national colors and cures that came in, and he treated everybody the same. And so whenever he said, I want to tell stories on my, the Kirkwood employees, it was in the same vein of, I want to tell the stories about my collar and cure friends. It all fell into the same category. And so um, <laughs> one of the things he, he made me promise him was that this book would not be bigger than Bob Osgood's book. So I contacted the guy that did Bob Osgood's book and it was 70,000 words. And Flippo's book, before we added the index, I've got an extended in index, was uh, under 60,000. So I, I did what he promised. So that was the other reason I could not include more things in. I was on a word count uh, mission too. One of the stories that he told that I thought would be really hilarious 
He told stories on June Hauser, who was the, the best waitress at uh, Kirkwood, and she was fast, and she, she was an amazing woman. He also told a story about Harry Linwood, who was the night watchman there, and the kids all loved him. One of the things that happened at Kirkwood, this was in a time whenever they had what they call senior week, and this is when kids went on senior trips. I'm a part of that generation. And a lot of the people out of the Midwest sent their kids to Kirkwood for a few days. It wasn't uh, for um, senior week. And so Harry was the night watchman and the kids loved him, but he was still kind of stern. So he was watching two scared senior boys and they were kind of sneaking around and he caught him outside after curfew and he flashed his really strong flashlight in their eyes. So what did they do? Because they were afraid they started running down the hill and there was a drop off, like a foot drop off. And so one of the, he was afraid they were, you know, they were gonna get hurt. So he went after them to make sure that, you know, they were okay. And uh, so he didn't find them. But he kept looking around and he was doing his rounds later on that evening and he saw one of he saw one of the guys and he saw that he was behind the bush and this is he was so funny so he went up and stood next to the bush he stood with his leg next to the bush and he said i don't know where those boys went i just don't know where those boys went and then harry said I put my leg right up against the bush and I could, right up against the boy and I could feel him shaken because he, 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 he was that close to him. And so when Flippa was telling the story, he was laughing like crazy and he said, oh, here's one of them right here. So what he did is he just took him and escorted him home and one of them, the one that fell, he kind of did sprain his ankle, but um, he really, he really wanted to share about the wonderful people. So that's a little bit of a sampling of what there's uh, going to be on the private memberships. Also, there's a story by a guy named Tex Brownlee, Al Tex Brownlee. And then those of you from Texas, who I'm sure you probably know and remember him. And <laughs> he has a story I couldn't put in the book and it's on the private membership. So uh, you're gonna wanna look for those. So we have kind of arrived at that part of the time where we're gonna do questions and answers. So if anybody's got a question, you're more than, we can either raise hands. If you raise your hand, I can call on you that way. So Lisa, or was your hand up for something else? We need to unmute you. If you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand or a comment. It doesn't have to be a question. It can be a comment. Okay, Sherry, Sherry wants to. Go ahead, Sherry. You're okay. muted, so let's unmute you. You can unmute yourself. I'll ask you to unmute you. Okay. Um, I wanted to know what year Flip actually started calling. 1954. 1954? 53 or 54. Somewhere in that vicinity, yeah. I think yeah. it was. Yeah, you know he started, do you know where he started calling? Does everybody know where he started calling? Started no. calling in a chicken coop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there was a friend of there was a friend of theirs there in the Abilene area. You know, square dancing was hot at the time, and um, so to get to, to get to square dance in the Abilene area, you had to get on a list. There was uh, you didn't just automatically get into a club. It was very very involved, and so that one of the guys, one of friends flip friends of Flips, had a chicken coop and said, "I think we can get a square or two in there." I'll clean it out. And what, and you know what, Flip wasn't, what, he didn't really start, plan on starting calling. They were each gonna take a um, figure or take what, something, and they were each gonna call, and he was the one that it stuck on. So that's-, that's what, what One other thing I wanted to know is how, how much that he actually talked about Kirkwood, because that was my, my experience uh, with him primarily uh, when I was a teenager. And 
he's the one who taught me how to water ski. And I wonder if he talked about water skiing because the thing that always impressed all of us young people is that that guy could take off of the deck of the pier water skiing and then come back and let go and end up on the pier. So he never got wet. <laughs> and he was, he was an incredible sl slalom skier. And I remember how upset I was because when he and Frank Lane got so involved with golf, he would never go down to the waterfront anymore. <laughs> you know what, Gerald wants to answer, wants to come in on that too, because he was a part of all that too. Yeah, um, I don't. I think every kid that ever went to Kirkwood, Flip taught us how to water ski. Uh huh. We always called him Captain Flippo, and as <laughs> the years went by, he got promoted to Admiral Flippo. <laughs> he would he would walk out of the afternoon workshop. Had a, he'd always have on a pair of slacks, cowboy boots, and usually a white shirt. He'd roll up. He'd take his boots and socks off, roll up his pants, walk down on the deck. And he would take off from the deck, just like Sherry said, and ski around when you could, when you could still ski in the cove right there. Right. He would ski around, the boat would come by, swing way out, and Flip would come running up. On, he would jump off. Uh, a lot of times now he was doing this barefooted too, not just with ski. <laughs> yeah. But, but he would uh, yeah. jump, uh, jump like he just walked off the water, stepped onto the boat dock, and would run right across the boat dock and then put his boots back on and head back upstairs. <laughs> it was hilarious. Oh, oh, oh. You mentioned it. about the senior trips. For years, I did the opening week at Kirkwood and I would, I would go in on uh, usually a Tuesday or a Wednesday and I would, he would give me my room, I'd unpack, and then I would go to St. Louis, catch a flight and fly out and do a weekend in New Orleans. Oh. And uh, those, that two days usually that I was there before I leave, he they were having the senior trips and it was hilarious. There was never a dull moment with those senior trips. And I can honestly say every time I was there, I was recruited to help patrol the area. And the <laughs> that, he, knew every, he knew every trick that the kids had. And they, he, he would drive them crazy, uh, you know, finding out where they hid their cigarettes, where they hid their booze. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was great. Those are some, those are some great, great times. Well, he, he tells, I'll tell you one story that he tells in the book about one of the very first times that he, he called there and uh, Bill Hagedorn was the owner. And anytime he mentioned Bill Hagedorn's name, he would always add the best boss, the best boss I ever had. And um, so um, he was asleep. The senior week was over. He's probably tired, you know. And the senior week was over. The phone rang. And it was Bill. And, and Bill said, Flip, they want more square dancing. Get dressed. Get down here. They want more square dancing. So he got dressed. He, he got up, got up quick, went down there and did another, you know, did it however, however many more he could do before the bus drivers had to pack the whole thing in. And um, so uh, he did this kind of repeatedly for, for uh, two or three of the, the uh, senior weeks. And so he flipped, said to Bill, he said, hey, why don't we just plan on doing this? And, he, and Bill said, no, we want him to ask for it. And I thought how wise that was, you know, so that they, they, they ask for it. So, okay, more questions or comments. You know, we have lots of people here that have experiences with uh, Flip. There's Lynn and Cliffy. <laughs> Yay. Doc, hey. hey. When, you had the, when you had the senior kids there, did they teach them to square dance? Yes, square dancing was the, what they did. Yes, they did. Cool. Yeah, yeah and I, you know what's the interesting part too is that those kids became square dancers and then they came back they had other weeks through you know for at, at kirkwood they had they had this the senior week then they had just regular people in for hall you know for a vacation but they had square dancing and then they had square dancing at the end of the season and when flip started there was and if i think somewhere around six weeks and by the time he left i, I think there was a lot more than that so what great. happened 
But what happened was, is we grew score dancers there because the seniors, you know, they, they learn, they love it, they went home, they were square dancers, they had kids. And he talked about having people there at Kirkwood that he knew the kids and he knew their grandkids, you know, it was generational. So, oh, so. awesome, yes. wonderful. Can I say something else? You bet, Daryl, go ahead. Um, he's talking about the senior weeks. Um, when my parents started going there, we, they went to just a square dance week. And then we had so much fun that we can, my sister and I convinced them to go back for one of the family weeks. And uh, they, would always, they would always shut Kirkwood down during the middle of the summer from square dancing and they would run uh, family weeks. And we would go to the family weeks and of course, there was all sorts of activities for us, but every night there would be square dancing. And that's actually where I got to really do my, you know, he would invite anybody up to the stage that wanted to call. And uh, I did, I decided one time I wanted to try it and uh, had a blast. He says, well, son, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> they were wonderful, you know, and, and I'll say this too. I still see kids that went to those family weeks or the square dance weeks. And I, and we would, Decca and I would meet them, meet some of them every year when we'd go back to Kirkwood, just up until a year, year before last, when, you know, when they had their last season. So oh. it, it was incredible. The camaraderie and the friendships you built was just incredible. That is amazing. That is amazing. Oh, Loretta. Yes, John. May I say something? You bet. Uh, Melton Luttrell presented Flippo with the Collar Lab Milestone Award back in 1980. And of course, Melton and Flip had been friends ever since Flip began calling. Uh, Melton was lived out near Abilene and Breckenridge and called around in that area. And uh, we all know that Flippo was a fantastic caller. He had tremendous timing. He had tremendous rhythm. Uh, and it was just really great. But Melton said the first time he heard him do a guest tip or guest number, he yeah. said, really awful. <laughs> <laughs> it, and, and Flip had to learn and teach himself how to do what he finally learned how to do. And wow. we all know that he said more words in his patter calling than any other caller alive. <laughs> and uh, we had numerous conversations. I first met him back in the early 60s down in Austin, Texas at a festival that Melton Luttrell was calling. And later on, after we got to know each other real well, I told him, I said, you say more words in your patter calling than any other caller in the business. You just barely have time to take a short breath occasionally. <laughs> and I said, why do you do that? And he said that he had a real problem learning rhythm, but he said, Nisa told him that you can pat your foot in rhythm with the music that you're playing. And that's the rhythm that you need to use. So why don't you say something every time you pat your foot? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's why I say more words than anybody else. <laughs> wow. Very interesting to hear that. And I've told that story numerous times in various places, but it, uh, a really good learning process that he had to go through. Yeah, Melton, Melton also told him that whenever he did that first calling, at, it was at Cisco, Texas, he told him, don't, don't quit your day job. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have a question. Um, hi, hi uh, Len. How are you doing? <laughs> hey. Bill, I see you over there. Um, <laughs> my question is, I can remember two of the callers that used to call, that Flippo called with, uh, Scott Smith and Ken Bauer. But there were like at least two others that um, um, that I cannot think of their names. And, uh, oh, I was... Yeah, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You're talking uh -huh. about 
you're talking about the chaparral boys is what yeah, you're, that's, that's who that's who flippo that's what flippo would call them the chaparral boys and there was burl main and there was gary shoemake ken bauer mm -hmm. and and jerry Hegg. and so what happened was whenever burl main got cancer and passed you know was they he was getting rid you know they knew he was sick and and uh, it was not looking good for his future. <laughs> Flip has a funny way of saying this. He said it took two people to replace Burl Maine. So they hired oh, Flip and they've hired um, Scott Smith. But oh was, my. Yeah, and there's, there, you know, he had an endure. You know, you bring up a very interesting topic because, you know, he, he got his career at uh, Blue Star Records at, with Norman and Nadine Merivac from uh, San Antonio, Texas, and uh, whenever he had to, whenever he was given the opportunity to change over to Chaparral, and you will find this in the book, that was one of the hardest decisions he ever ever had to make in his life because Norman and Nadine gave him his break. You know, they were with the ones blue, with Blue Star, with Blue Star Records, with Blue Star Records, and with the auctioneer, and so um, he he labored over that and. Uh, and labored over it and decided to go with Chaparral. And, you know, he never regretted it because he had such an awesome time with all of them. He has phenomenal stories in the book about each one of those guys. And then some of them are on the, the members only because again, I didn't have enough space, but um, yes, he, he had such a good time with those callers, that, that whole setup of them, you know. Well, did did Ken Bauer ever mess with Marshall Flippo's hair? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I want to tell a story. If you're going to talk about stories about hair, I've got to tell you, there's one person on this uh, call that he talked, two people, he always talked about their hair. Ken Bauer's hair, he, he was in awe of Ken Bauer's hair. And anytime he talked about Jerry Junk, he said, don't believe him, he wears a toupee. So <laughs> he always had a thing about other people and their hair. And, and, you know, he would, and that was probably because his was such a, he had such a slick head, you know? So we have a few minutes. Yes, Jerry. Well, Loretta, in response to that, every <laughs> time I called with Flippo, he always mentioned my hair. And I said, you know, some people use head and shoulders and some people use mop and glow. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if Doc might have a flippo story, something that happened in Japan. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh Raleda? Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for asking me to read on. Uh, you and the, uh, the Japanese scholars, and the, the, there are many scholars who know Marshall Flippo very well, <laughs> and uh, including Prince Mikasa. Prince Mikasa is a good friend of uh, Marshall Flippo, if you know. Uh -huh. they, I yes. sent you the, some photo, uh, the yes. Nisa and the yes. ex-wife, and uh, Marshall were talking with uh, Prince Mikasa of Japan, uh, in, Imperial family. Did you know everybody? Did everybody understand that, get that? Yes. Flip, yes. Flippo was a good friend. He called to, first time he went to Japan, I think it was the first time, he called to the prince there. Mm. And it was very, the prince was a square dancer. And um, it was a very <sighs> interesting situation because um, he, uh, he was told that uh, the prince was only gonna be there 20 minutes and that the mm -hmm. prince only knew a certain certain set of calls. And so yeah. Flippo knew what he had to call to be successful. And the prince was having such a phenomenal time that he stayed for, was it two hours? Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, and the dancers loved it. You know, Flip apologized to the dancers afterwards and said, you know, I'm sorry. I know that wasn't quite challenging enough for you. They were just delighted, weren't they, Doc? They loved it. And uh, all Japanese callers enjoyed his joke. You know, the, the, he, he is uh, uh, 
uh, quite good at uh, making joke about anything. And that uh, even though, uh, maybe you can imagine that there are many, don't many uh, Japanese people understand any joke, I mean, English joke. <laughs> but still, still, when they, uh, they uh, Marshall Filippo make a joke uh, about anything, oh, everybody laugh. Well, without knowing the meaning. <laughs> That's the only way we enjoy him, right? <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, I'm glad that the uh, Masaru Wada Milestone uh, uh, Award recipient uh, was uh, on that uh, photo. And uh, there are several other scholars, uh, scholars, Japanese scholars uh, uh, who belong to uh, uh, Royal Records and uh, 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 elite record and so, so forth, and uh, they they really love to send me the information and I sent to you later. Thank you very much for giving me that job. That's <laughs> all. Thank you. Well, you know, John. Did we keep you from breakfast? <laughs> Sorry? Did, did we keep you from breakfast? <laughs> what does it mean? Had your breakfast? Yeah. You kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> What is, what is the time. meaning? One, one yeah, of the, the time. time. Time different? Yeah, the time. Yeah, time. Uh, this, this timing is the super. This, uh, in the morning, 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. That's the awesome. super. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I'm 10 at night. <laughs> Doc, Doc was instrumental in the book. Whenever you read the, the, all the stories from Japan, about the, there are several stories in the book from Japan. Japanese callers and Doc was the one that orchestrated all of that. Um, there's a cure friend of ours too, and I don't know how to pronounce her her last name. Martha, you know her, I'm sure. She, I interviewed her at the Senior Games last year, and she said that there's a whole generation of callers in Japan that call with a Texas accent. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, come back to y'all. <laughs> Which is hilarious, yeah. you know. That, that was, uh, uh, you know, the love affair, <laughs> the interesting thing is the love affair was mutual. Flippo loved the Japanese people and the colors and the cures, and they absolutely loved him too. But, you know, he, wherever Flippo went, you know, he made friends, that's for sure. Is there and anybody Ray else? Daryl has his hand up. Okay, Daryl, yes, go for it. Thank you. Yeah, when you were talking about Blue Star and the auctioneer, uh, the very first time I ever called with Flip, he says, "For he's you know we did our pattern." And he says, "What do you want to do for a singer?" And I said, "Oh, I don't care. It doesn't matter." So what's he put on the auctioneer? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of stood there and watched him call. So from that point on, I made damn sure that whenever he asked me, "What do you want to do?" I had something. <laughs> Jerry, did he get you on that? Because I know he did more colors that way. I know several that he did that way. You learn right off the bat. Tell him what you want to do. Don't say it doesn't matter because you're going to be an auctioneer. There are several of you that were not here whenever I started this, and we started with the auctioneer. So you know what? I think I might go back to that. That might be a great segue right now because to me that's classic. I just love that. Um, we are, I'm over by three minutes and I'm always one that feels like our, our time is, is important. Does anybody else have something they would like to share? Loretta? Yes? 
I just wanted to ask, how long did Flippo work with Frank Lane at Kirkwood? Oh, wow. That's a good question. I have, no, I have no idea. You know, I'm glad, Sherry, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, there, there were key players in Flippo's life, you know, the callers uh, that were a major part of his life. And one of the, one of the key players was Frank Lane. And um, he passed away this last year and um, I did not get a chance to talk to him. But you will read in the, he had stories galore about Frank Lane. And, and if you're not familiar with, uh, there was a, um, a division in the calling world at, at one time. You, we, I think everybody here are uh, dancers except for my friend Marty up here. So they, this, you, you can enjoy this, Marty. But anyway, we had what they call star figures and that was the, that was earlier in square dancing and the star through came in and Frank Lane did not like the name star through because he thought it was going to affect how uh, dancers and callers thought of the star figures. So he changed the name. He called it Snapperoo. <laughs> and so um, Flip had a call that he really liked, and it was called Barge Through. And so they had this, and it was similar to what uh, we know today as a trade by. Uh, there's a, a call before it that I, it's escaping me right now. But anyway, so they had these two calls that they um, called that were their favorites. And they would battle it out, you know, I guess at different times and that they were a color lab. And Jim Mayo talks about this in his book, Step by Step. If you don't have that book, that's really a phenomenal book on the history of square dancing. And, Can I show um, you a picture? On TV. Who's yeah, saying, oh yeah, oh, here we go. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, there you go. That's in the book. I, or, that's a picture. Sherry's mom and dad were cures at Kirkwood. Manning and Nita Smith. So let me, so it's Flippo and Nisa on the, uh, I, I'm, the way I'm looking at it is Flip, Flippo and Nisa on the left. And then Frank Lane and Barbara are on the right and your parents are in the middle. That's correct. Yeah. That was uh, mother and dad were at Kirkwood with them for 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they were all very, very uh, close to my heart. But I think Flippo Flip was one of the most, the funniest natural comedian that I ever, ever saw. He was naturally funny. And the only time I ever saw him frustrated was I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the the uh, it's a folk dance called tenickling where you dance in and out of of bamboo poles that are being clapped to, together uh, oh. on the floor oh, and he that. had on his cowboy boots and he could not get the rhythm to go in and out of those <laughs> poles for thunder. <laughs> and I got scared. I was afraid he was going to fall, but he was determined and he, but he, he just kept getting hit, but it didn't matter because he had his cowboy boots on. But he was such an awesome person. Thank you for providing this book because I cannot wait to get my hands on it. Awesome. 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 Yes. Frank Lane was uh, a key player in Flip's life and you'll see that repeatedly. They not only called it Kirkwood, but they called it a Silomar, which is Mary's, Mary Johnson's on the call from California. And she provided a lot of the pictures of, <laughs> uh, of a Silomar and she, there's a chapter in the end, in the latter part of the book called for, uh, four more some four more something specials and what he got to do in his last year some of the very special things in his life he he wanted to do he got to go to caller lab for the last time he got to go to the nationals for the last time and he got to go to Asilomar. and mary's the one that made it happen and uh he it was a dream come true for him and uh frankly frank lane and uh flip called there a lot and 
pull tricks on each other. I mean, <laughs> yes. the tricks, you know, I don't know, the, the callers that are here today, today do, do, they, do the callers do the tricks that those guys used to do? I mean, oh, God, Jerry <laughs> Jung says yes. <laughs> Lisa's saying yes. You know, it's just, I just love the sense of humor they, those guys had. They were just, um, they were always doing things that showed how much they loved each other, I think. I mean, that's what it was about, was how much they loved each other. Okay, I'm not going to keep you much longer because I, you know, I, unless somebody has a, some last thing to share. Mary, did you want to share something? Daryl Lipskin. No, Mary, Mary Johnson from, oh, Daryl, do you, okay, go ahead, Daryl. And yeah. think, think, Mary. When uh, Sherry held up the picture from Kirkwood, when Kirkwood sold, I asked to get all the pictures there because I found out that the ones in the day room, which were the latest pictures, were all trashed. Oh, no. Oh. But John Flippo knew where there was a stash of, old 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 pictures and i got all of, i got all of those oh. uh john john sent them to me and i've got them I, I got them this past winter i haven't had a chance to go through them all of them yet but i've got uh a couple of cases of big boxes of them so if anybody's interested in it i might have some you know in those boxes is it this wow. <laughs> yeah there's a lot of those in there yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of uh, group pictures, and we have uh, several of them from the 60s. Yeah, there's a lot of individual, just single pictures as well. It was quite a, oh, wow, I couldn't believe it. And they were just going to be destroyed. That is unbelievable. It's horrible when people do something like that. Okay, Mary. Um, anyway, just going to say, am I on? Yeah, you are. Okay, great, thanks. Um, just what a, a privilege and how blessed I was to know Flippo for so many years and how he introduced me to so many really wonderful people, Frank Lane, the Osgoods, on and on on and on. And um, that through him got to dance uh, with John Jones, with Jerry Junk, with Mike Seastrom, and so many other really wonderful couples, callers. And um, thank you, thank you, Loretta, for your perseverance on this project because it does our hearts so much good. He's gone, but definitely not forgotten. And your work, your labor of love, makes sure that he will never be forgotten for generations to come. So thank you and bless you and amen. Thank you, thank you, amen. thank you. Yeah. Okay, anybody? Anybody else? Okay, I could, Loretta, yes? Loretta, yeah. I would like to just clarify one thing. Okay. I came to love Flippo like everybody else did. And you can see the picture of him right behind uh, Loretta. I just wanted to clarify, after this broadcast, he gets put away. He does not get to stand in our bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> oh good gravy okay that leave it to lynn right those of you who know lynn okay um i just there's a couple of things i want to end on um i hope you some of you may not know this but when when flip and i talked about the finances of this book uh i asked him what he thought was going to be a good uh division of monies and he said Alrighty, you get it all. You're doing all the work. What are you talking about? And I said, wait a minute, we got to do, you know, we got to do something. So we came up with the decision that 10% of the profits will go to Color Lab. And um, I don't know exactly uh, how that will be decided. John Flippo, uh, Dana, um, he was, I, I think was on the call a minute ago. I don't know if he's still on, but um, the, John Flippo is going to be the one that decides how, uh, what direction that money goes to. So, uh, Joey, is Joey wanting to say something? Joey? No, I just uh, really want to thank you. Uh, you've already, I, I, I can't remember if that was Mary or who brought it up, but just thank you for all the work you did because it, it's wonderful. The book is great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for doing this too. This is really fun. Oh yeah, I, thank you. I, I thought this was gonna be a great, it's been everything I thought it could be and more because it's just been, it feels like it's been really informal. I mean, I've had my little spiel that, you know, I've followed my, my scripts and things that I've done but I really wanted it to be interactive. That's the wonder of Zoom. And you know, uh, before I do any spill, any more spill, I went, we, I did this early on, but I wanna do it now while there's more people here. Marty Northrup is on the video with us on the meeting tonight, and he's waving right now. And he has got a podcast, it's called Marty's Podcast. And I've got information over on the, um, on the chat on the ways to connect with him. It's Marty's podcast and it's Buzzsprout, I do believe. If you'll Google that, you'll find he's interviewed, he's been doing it about two years, but he's interviewed some really amazingly interesting people. He interviewed me, <laughs> but he interviewed, he's interviewed some really uh, interesting people in the square dance world. And it's Marty's podcast, let's see, it should be on the, the um, yeah, Google Marty's podcast on Buzzsprout. I just wanted to do a, a, a shout out for him. So uh, when you purchase the book, some of them, you know, 10% will go to the Collar Lab Foundation. If you buy the book from me, you get it autographed. Uh, you can go to my website and my website is on here and uh, you can pay for it through PayPal. Uh, you can send me a check. If you would rather write, do a check, then you can just send me a check and uh, you can email me. Um, you can also buy it at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. It's also in, it's also in the four ebook uh, formats. And when I made it, I I made it. I uh, you you'll, for the answers, you may wonder why I put all the footnotes and all that. I wanted uh, non dancers to be able to understand what we were talking about. After you've read, read the book, I really hope that you will write a review on Amazon and or Goodreads, because that the way they, deal, uh, they promote books is by the reviews and it takes 10 to just get a boost. So that's really, really important. Um, when this virus ends, Lynn and I will be hitting the road again, I know, and so, you know, we're, we will be going out somewhere. So if you have an event that you might want me to come and sell my books at, one of your festivals or whatever, you know, send me an email and I'll put it on my our schedule and hopefully we'll be able to see you there. So now we're gonna do the drawing for the, um, oh, I don't think I, okay, the drawing for the, the uh, door prizes, we're at the door prize time. So. The very first one is going to be, these are books, my previous books. The first drawing is going to be for what I call a Western bundle. It's a, uh, nope, it's the wrong one. I it together wrong. Uh, when Will Papa Get Home? And then let me tell you a story. This is a historic fiction, and this is a nonfiction about our family ranch. And then you will get a Flippo uh, swag that has a picture of him, and it's a, it's a bottle opener. So, first one, Lynn. Lynn, the first one. Okay, we're ready. I'm going to put this on my head so everybody can see. It's totally anonymous. They can't see it. They can't see it. <laughs> You're too tall. Oh, there you go. How's that? Okay, there's the first one. And the winner is a Fly Girl. That's how she, that, that's how she came in. I don't have a name. Who is Fly Girl? Fly Girl? Who's Fly Girl? Is Fly Girl still here? Maybe we need to draw again. Draw me, draw me. No, I don't think so. Fly Girl, is well, Fly Girl here? She's gone, so we'll draw again. Okay. All right. Fly Girl has flown. <laughs> flown. All right, here we go. Ah, the winner is Haraway. <laughs> okay, awesome. I have I have your address, so I will we will we'll get that to you. Okay, the next uh, drawing will be for it's a memoir bundle. It's my this tumbleweed landed, which is about my growing up in uh, 
the little ranching community during the 50s and 60s, and then A Time to Grow Up, which is my grief and growth memoir when my parents passed away. And the winner is John Jones. Oh, and John, I have, I have your address, so I'll send those to you. The last one, the last one is a bundle of swag for Flippo. There is a bottle opener that has lots of really great pictures. There's a deck of cards that has a variety of pictures. And then there's a shopping bag that has Woo! a variety of pictures. <laughs> oh. And the winner is... No, I think I need to draw again. Who is this guy, Joey Solis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I have Joey's address, so I'll get it to him. So I'm going to leave you with this thought and we're going to end with the song that the title of this book came from. So was Flippo lucky or was he skilled? Was it both? both? What do you think? Both. Both? Yeah. Both. And we'll end mm. with, I have just, I'm going to ask your opinion. I, I did just a clip of just another square dance caller. However, I do have the whole song. So would you rather hear the clip or the whole song? Whole song. Whole song. Mm -hmm. Whole song. Okay. Okay. I just want to be in the right place at the right time. If you do, I'll sit right down and cry. But if you said I sing like Gary Schumann, then I know that all you can turn on my side. Circle it. I'm just a little square dance caller. Try to make my living for the song. Maybe one day I'll get to Nashville. I get to promenade and get about halfway. I'm the little and do the wild lift. But every wheel across the floor, sweep the floor and more, pass through the loop like a left foot. Why don't you swing through the now let those boys run like do a hat tag swing and promenade? Maybe one day I'll get the nice way wrong home. That dog on the road so long. Now hit promenade and get about halfway. Down the middle and do the wild left foot. But every old cross floor, we have four and more. Last through the new the one I left through. Why don't you swing through and now let those boys run like do a head tag swing and climb a knee. Maybe one day I'll get the nice big long home. Just to go to the McDonald's on the road. The side face grand square. Some folks say I fall like Kenny Bauer. But I say Kenny Bauer calls like me. Sells a million of every single spot. I must be doing something wrong. Circle and I did money. I'm just another square dance caller. Trying to make my living with a song. Comedy. Maybe one day I'll get to Nashville on home. But you know that dog on the road is so long. Outside promenade and get about halfway. Down the middle and do the wild left foot. Butter wheel across the floor, sweep a quarter more, pass through them, do the wild left foot. Come on now, swing through them now, let those boys run away. Do a half tag swing and promenade. Maybe one day I'll get the last bit of a long, but you don't get that dog on the road so long. Now side promenade and get about halfway. Down the middle and do the wild left foot. Water wheel across the floor, sweep the floor and more, pass through and do the wild left foot. You might not get to swing through and now let those boys run like do a half tag swing and promenade. Maybe one day I'll get the nice thing along, but the only that dog on the road is so side face, grand square. Dolly Parton sings just like an angel. She sings as pretty as can be. I'll never be as famous as Sweet Dolly. She has two big advantages on me. Circle me. I'm just another square dance caller.
just been very special it couldn't have been better thank you and each one of you made it special thank you thank you Lorena thank you thank you thank you Lorena Kiko thank you so good to see everybody thanks Lorena yeah see you again thank you thank you bye 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 see y'all in the square huh Yes, yeah, hopefully so. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for my bye, grandchild. Bye, Mimi, Mimi, bye bye. <laughs> there you are. Hey, <laughs> I'm seeing so many people that I that I've met through Flip. I just this is so fun. It's amazing. <laughs> so amazing. Bye, and, and thank you so much for all you did. I I am indebted to you. You're certainly welcome, and you did an awesome job. Thank awesome you. job. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Bye, how do I? Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey, hey Slappy. Bye bye. <laughs>